Hello and welcome to the Robot Wars History Podcast, a podcast where we chart the development of the show and the British robot combat scene in general by looking at key teams and bots. I'm your host, Toon Ganondorf, today for this Series 4 Notables episode, and I'm joined today by Tale of the Toaster. Evening, how are we doing, ladies and gentlemen? And Dan the Man. Hang on a minute, I'm not NJG Woo. So we have a very... Diverse lineup of you for you tonight or this morning, depending on your time of listening. Uh, a mix of semi finalists, heat finalists, and a couple of beloved first round or second round dropouts who've captured our hearts and minds, even though they never captured combat victories. So we're going to move at a brisk pace and we are going to start with a semi finalist in the form of Splinter. Oh, poor old Splinter. Splinter, who is... It's very curious to name a robot Splinter when there's no wood in it. Uh, or it doesn't even vaguely resemble a Splinter. It is yes. somewhat... That was my thought for the day. I'm going home now. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> very diverse. It is... Uh, and it's, it's a strange follow-up to Ivanhoe as well. Like, Ivanhoe, obviously... It's inspired by the very famous fantasy book, Ivanhoe, um, and it's got the whole knight theme. It's got the mace, and it's got the knight helmet. And then to go from Ivanhoe to Splinter, I mean, I've never read Ivanhoe. Maybe that's a reference, but they keep the team Ivanhoe thing, but they just lean into a completely different theme altogether. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's less about a wood splinter and more about splintering off into something new. I think that's I've a never really bit... considered that before, but yeah, hey, that's I think that might be a bit out there. <laughs> the the tagline in the Ultimate Guide is a chip off the old block, so yeah, maybe there's something in that. Yeah, so is that? Well, they they come up with that afterwards, but like yeah, I was gonna say, is that inspired by the name, or is the name inspired by that? Yeah, they tried to enter series three together. They had Ivanhoe two and Splinter, so maybe it really was just the Splinter project. Mm. off to the side well we're only four minutes into this podcast and already my brain's expanded yes it's <laughs> yeah. all about it's all about knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge here at the robot wars history podcast so splinter mm. having qualified for series four uh, is put into what we would probably argue is an opportunity heat uh, it's up to you depending on how your expectations are of kilohertz at this point in time, but it's in the Centurion <laughs> wow. small talk. It was an opportunity heat, all right. Yeah, four kilohertz. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Not even getting a contact, a combat win at that point in Robot Wars. Yeah, but uh, well, we'll get to that. So the uh, the Poor first round hurts. melee with the uh, seated Centurion and Small Talk, who are supposedly Small Talk and Splinter are going to team up against Centurion. Splinter spends the entire fight bullying Small Talk, and yet Centurion loses anyway. It's a, a mm. wild ride, yeah. Heat Eye Eliminator. That's a slightly questionable, <laughs> you know. I mean, I mean, it's fucking Small Talk. It's like the 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 Nadir of of well, is it even the Nadir of Team Talk? I think Hippopotamus is. Either way, um, it's uh, it's probably. You know, Splinter gets to to really dominate, I suppose, in this first fight. Like, it's a good, pretty good showing for it, all told. Hmm. I like. I do like Splinter's design. It's something very different. Like, you know, Series Four has always been my favorite. You know, series for just the diversity of robots we got. Like, by the time we got to Thermidor's Heat, we had a front hinge flipper, a rear hinge flipper, a cutting disc, an axe. And a put and a ram bot, like we had, and then we got you get like your know, splinter. Thermidor two's got like um, claws, so we end up with spawn of scudder later on. It's just got such a diverse range of weapons in the semi-finals. I think the only one that doesn't, the only kind of weapon not represented in the semi-finals, I don't even think there is one. Like we've got axe, yeah, spinners, you count a hammer flippers. as separate to an axe. Yeah, not really. So it's uh, really diverse. It's, yeah, yeah. You, you've got a frigging mouse trap as a weapon in the yeah. semi-finals. For yeah, you got sake. you got an axe bot. You got a, a thwack bot. Um, just all all sorts. 
Whereas, you know, yeah, other it, great series like Series 7, they're almost all flippers. Series yep. 6 There's is like the There's a lifter as same. well, Panic is that? Yep. Series 6, it's like the same robots we've seen a billion times. So, like, that can yeah. only be so exciting. Um, I suppose and vertical you, the flywheel reboot is all, closest, yeah. The reboot's all spinners and flippers. Just yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. Get... Like, all Series 4 doesn't have is a vertical spinner. Take that, BattleBots. <laughs> ah, Pussycat, but, uh, kind of. Yeah, that's a cutting disc. It's a disc. cutting it's disc. Different. Yeah, it's too small. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Splinter's design, I can't unsee the baby bonnet, I have to admit. <laughs> it's just kind of... Uh, it was pointed out to me, not by myself, but as soon as I saw it, I, it, I couldn't let it go. Is it possible to point something always... out to yourself? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to you with an answer on that. Yeah, give me an days. answer on Splinter's name origin as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, see but, uh, one to me, thing I like. Uh, no, go ahead. No, nope. I refuse. <laughs> All right, then fuck it. Uh, I would be splintering back to the original topic. Okay, yeah. See, see, to me, Splinter, like, to me, it always just looked like that, kind of like that Thunderbirds vehicle, the Firefly. Oh yeah. I mean, I thought more of Bear Moth when I played with my own Firefly toy at home. Well, for me, it was both. But true. We needed we needed a robot that resembled the mole. We and did. Ming Dynasty didn't quite cut it, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. But um, so we'll move into th- at least the second round. But the last thing I want to say about the first round melee, which amuses me, is that out of Splinter, Small Talk, and Centurion, the seeded robot is Centurion, which has like one win to its name. Yeah. It, was, it didn't even do particularly well in the second round of series three well, you put that against the other robots small talk did just as well in series three as all talk it got to the second round decisively and did well and had the world championship as well but then it even had a series two heat final and so did splinter yeah i just realized that as well the seed is the so only like... one who did not reach a heat final in its life <laughs> yeah it was the least qualified one to be there but yeah. presumably that's why they it didn't, fell in the end. Presumably they didn't give it to Small Talk because Small Talk is Small Talk. Hey, I actually don't mind well, Small Talk. I don't get the hate for Small Talk as well. Yeah, sure, it's not that good. But, you know, it's it's harmless. I actually quite like it. It's a proper pioneer of the modern design. It's just a really compact robot with a vertical spinning weapon and you know, all the all the internals are packed together. It could. Mm. I think it was invertible as well. It could have genuinely been really good had it not just caught fire all the time. Well, we could be talking <laughs> about small talk on this podcast in an alternate universe, couldn't we? Yeah. How does how does Splinter yeah. actually beat Kilohertz? Because this is a fight that I Splinter doesn't have damage potential or KO potential. There's no pit release button. Uh, it's just sort of I just remember Splinter pushing Kilohertz around and then you know. Kilohertz is lost. It's like that that meme where it's like you know, push mm. kilohertz around? Question mark? Question mark? Question mark? Profit. It's like I don't get uh, the plan. <laughs> got uh, kilohertz got uh, got pushed. Uh, oh no! Kilohertz drove itself into shunt CPZ. Uh, shunt then damaged it, and then kilohertz was stuck in forward drive. Uh, uh, that doesn't sound like kilohertz at all. Fire. So it died in the most kilohertz way possible, basically. Yeah. And so with Kilohertz out of the competition, this opportunity heat suddenly becomes a showdown between Splinter, Small Talk, and Eric. And that slowly becomes Splinter versus Eric. Uh, and Splinter puts on quite a, quite a actually fun fight against Eric. You wouldn't have picked Splinter as the... F- well, I mean, would you have picked Splinter as the favourite going into this? Um, probably. probably, yes. I mean, it did a really good job of handling Kilohertz. Yeah, fair enough. Kilohertz lost because it got stuck in forward drive of its own violation in the end, but it was still dominating the fight up to that point, whereas Eric was clearly second best to Kilohertz in the opening melee. And, yeah, I think... I mean, it's hard to say. I, I started with Series 7, of all things, so I can't exactly recount my first time viewing series four and certainly i knew the splinter won the heat because uh, well it has it has this other fight that i may or may not have seen yeah well but... black and blue wait <laughs> is it the right team that's the wrong team never mind ignore me uh, rcc 
But no, I mean, either way, it was a really, really good fight, and Eric at some points comes really close to getting Splinter mm. over, and had it done so, well, we would have had a different face in a really famous fight that we might as well move on to. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, yeah. I do I do remember seeing this one. This is one of those, those heats between heats G and J that I watched a billion times as a kid because we had them on the old VHS, and I actually do remember this fight happening. And um, the show had a real habit of hyping whoever, if you weren't the big seed, whoever took out the big seed. So this is one of the few occasions where we got two unseeded heat finalists. I think the other examples were Mousetrap and Little Fly. Were there any others? I think that was it. Um, and Splinter was sort of the favourite because it had beaten Kilohertz, whereas... Eric had only beaten Small Talk. Technically, the other Splinter one, by the way, was Thermidor the and Chronic. Ah, oh, Thermidor and Chronic. That's another one, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, let's let's move on to that fight. We've talked about it pretty pretty commonly. Uh, it's a it's an all star classic fight versus Hypno Disc. There's really not a whole lot to say except that Splinter is arguably just as recognisable in smithereens as it is in its you know fully intact form yeah oh god and, and jonathan's thing. jonathan's line in it just as everything all goes wrong for splinter is just a brilliant line as well yeah the the scoop coming off is just a beautiful piece of you know it's on and then like you, you blink and it's completely torn out of place yeah, it, it's like they, they clearly ha have grasped the idea of how do you fight a horizontal spinner and it, smother it with with a with some heavy armoured scoop or wedge, but unfortunately their scoop is made of a oil drum or something. And yeah. It's, yeah, something like a... Wa an oil drum is probably too generous. I think it was something like a plastic water tank. It certainly does look that you have a bit for plastic. watering the plants in your garden. So I mean, yeah, it it frankly did well enough to stand up as long as it did. And all play to splinter. It starts really, really well. It does, yeah. And it ends really, really, really badly. Yeah, <laughs> oh, which is yeah. kind of a nice way of looking at Splinter's career overall. I don't want to make this the Splinter podcast, so we won't go fight by fight. But Splinter does sort of start its career quite impressively and then it sort of ends a bit less impressively uh you yeah. know the the second form of splinters the one that gets sort of rebuilt from the ashes uh you know it's got three axes now it's got a much more conventional sort of scoop shovel front but it just doesn't capture the same success it sort of gets left behind it's one of those semi-finalists of a different era who were never really going to be able to recapture it that. almost yeah. gets revenge on Hypnodisc in the Annihilator and Extreme, and then Pussycat Kill steals it, and yeah. But, uh... Yeah, that's that's frankly like the saddest moment in Robot Wars for me. I hate that moment where Hi Hypnodisc is dead in the Annihilator, Splinter has pushed it towards the pit, it's the most... You know, what more could they ask for? Getting revenge on Hypnodisc, pushing it into the pit. Yeah, the battle was an act, a complete shambles. Hypnotist didn't even work from the outset. But to get destroyed that badly by Hypnodisc, so famously, to actually come back and beat them would have been something really special for them. And, I mean, they did. They got the win. But then Pussycat, who's already beaten Hypnodisc before, just steals the kill and nudges it in. It's like, oh, dude... Come on, the line's only got three people in it and you've still pushed in and sneezed all over the food. Come on, what are you doing, man? This is why David Gribble yeah, I mean, This is why yeah. David Gribble's a good driver. He's just like, you know, opportunistic. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Then in the next round, uh Splinter does get outright killed by pussy. You think about it. If David Gribble just had like an eruption style flipper, then he'd be giving us six second fights. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. What a what a dreadful thought. I mean, yeah. But Splinter gets third in the Annihilator, and that is that is good because it goes past the likes of Thermidor and Exterminator and Hypnodisc, and is generally 
beating Pussycat in all of the rounds individually as well. It just doesn't manage to on this occasion when it gets its aerial sliced off. But mm. it was one step away from an Annihilator final, and that would have certainly solidified its career as somewhat back on form. Yeah, it would well, have made up for the fact that... A theme with this episode. It may make up for the fact that it should have probably lost to Agrobot and Killatron, considering it was, I think, the only robot ever successfully semi-immobilized by Agrobot's weird design. <laughs> uh, but, you know, then, it's kind of like a, yeah, a reverse just Thermidor. Just Splinter and Razor. No, no real important robots here. Yeah, it's kind of like a reverse Thermidor, isn't it? Splinter does well in the Annihilator after doing terribly in the Mayhem. Thermidor does amazingly yeah. in the Mayhem after doing terribly in the Annihilator. Or, and then going to do it terribly in the Annihilator. Yeah. And yeah. then, for Series 5, Splinter gets a... And it gets drawn against Viper 01. Which is Just possibly the most forgettable Rockley. fight in Series 5. Contender uh, for it. Well, there's there's plenty of forgettable Round 1 fights in Series 5. And I think the, those, fight, those fights being so forgettable are why Series 5 is so popular with people. Because we just don't remember the crap ones. <laughs> we, we, we think of Series 5 and we go, Oh yeah, that one with Wild Thing versus Chaos 2. That one with... with um, Bigger Brother Hypnodisc, that one with, uh, you know, all these other great... Wheelie Big Cheese and Axor. Forget the heats. Um, but speaking of Bigger Brother, uh, that's where Splinter's Robot Wars journey came to an end. It got yoked over the... Yeah. And that was kind of it. Yeah, Splinter... It was all fair enough, but at the end of the day, Splinter, despite having its bad losses... It actually finished with an 8-3 record, and all of those losses were against robots that have, at minimum, placed second yeah, in the UK Championship. That's true. Hypnotist, Pussy Pussycat, and Bigger Brother, unless you count Arnold A. Terminator, but it was Pussycat who got the kill. Oh, no, you, just say, like... you know, just say, at minimum, second in a tournament. <laughs> <laughs> if you really yeah. want to water it down to make yourself feel better. So, you know... Fluffy's lost to Infinity, but it got second in the tournament. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, all right. Well, that's so good for Splinter. What's your favourite fight? Is everyone just going to say Hypnodisc? It's uh, yeah. Yeah. I think the worst one is probably the Mayhem, or arguably the round of the Annihilator where Hypnodisc gets eliminated. That's a pretty bad fight. Oh, uh, Viper one, yeah. one's pretty the, bad. The second place choice would probably be the second round of Extreme One Annihilator. Okay, that's a low key Vega. choice. The one where Exterminator goes out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It would have been an even better fight if Exterminator didn't go out, but uh, well, that's just my opinion. Yeah. All right. Mm. Good hustle on Splinter. It was subsequently sold to a Dutch team uh, and fought with ground, but then it got. Badly destroyed by terahertz, and uh, I think they retired it, didn't they? That was the end of Splinter. Yeah, they got destroyed by two five nine in a series six qualifier, which is just further bad luck for them. And then, yeah, didn't qualify for series six or seven, and got retired by terahertz and Dominator. I think it was Dominator three actually. Terahertz probably wasn't there, but yeah, Splinter didn't have a good life after it disappeared from TV. Yeah, I mean, it's like yeah, with a name like Splinter, it was really just tempting fate. It was. Yeah. All right, well, before we move on, let's just quickly, because we're on Heat Eye, let's do Eric now as well, because that's on our list, and we've sort of covered a little bit of it, so we can quickly round them off before we move along. Yes. Guys, I've got a joke for you. Eric. Ha 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 ha! That's a fake laugh. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, Eric sure is a robot. That is a it is a thing that exists. It is a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so Eric, uh, good good enough looking robot. It was kind of like Razor Blade's more attractive sibling, in my opinion. Yeah. Oi, Razor Blade looks way better. I look. I like. <laughs> I like Eric a lot better than Razor Blade. It's they're quite <laughs> similar in many many ways, but. Um, yeah, I'm always a big fan of Eric. I like the way it looks. I like the dual use of its weapon, um, and I just love like the way that it sort of conducts itself in fights. Just all of Eric's battles, I find myself saying, "Oh, that looks good, though. Oh, that looks nice." Like the shot of Kilohertz axing their wheel, the shot of them backing into the pit against King Buxton, the shot of them overturning All Talk, that shot of 
Splinter pushing Eric into the wall where it sort of mounts up a little bit. It's just Eric's a very photogenic machine. I just dig it. Yeah, it, it doesn't yeah. look bad. I do like the uh, the fire pattern on it. The thing I like the most about Eric is that it's actually quietly really innovative and nobody noticed because I'm sure many people li- listening to this podcast will be familiar with the most recent season of BattleBot and how Team Waiachi's Hydra became very well known for innovating something we'd never seen before, the hydraulic flipper, where we thought, okay, hydraulics are only used to slowly crush or lift things. It could never make a flipper. And then along comes Team Waiachi, and they just make the most powerful flipper in the world using hydraulics. And we all thought it was a world's first, and it's certainly the first to do it to that kind of level, but there is one more hydraulic flipper in this world, and it's actually Eric. Well, and you just wouldn't be able to tell, but it, it genuinely did use a hydraulic system because it wanted to flip and crush at the same time. And the funny thing about it is the, the new owners of Eric, once, once they got it, uh, hydraulic flipping systems are banned in the UK, so they had to take it out no. and swap it for a more conventional pneumatic system. Well, because Eric was just so Eric, dangerous, it couldn't yeah, have it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But like, so Eric was about 80 kilos in Series 4. By the time they were done taking out the hydraulic system and putting in a pneumatic one instead, it weighed 50 kilograms. Wow. Jesus fuck. So it's like, <laughs> Eric had a 30 plus kilogram weapon, and it's like, oh, okay then. So this was real serious business. How come it didn't manage to flip Splinter over then? Yeah, or Destructor that... Bubble. <laughs> True. <laughs> Did it flip anything? Small talk. Small yeah, talk, yeah. Wow. It, fl- it flipped a tiny invertible robot. Which is exactly what Hydra couldn't do to Minotaur, but. Uh, 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 hmm. Mm. Sadness. So yeah, I think Very Eric ne- Eric now owned by a friend of the podcast, Anthony Murney, is that correct? Yes, it's been through a couple of owners, but it's it's in good hands now with our with our friend Anthony and he's I'm sure he'll do something with it. I don't think it's it's quite in need of returning to the war zone. We know what happened when it came back for a bash in twenty sixteen. It, it got the bash it was coming for. Uh, thank you for that one, Gabriel. That's <laughs> yep. footage for the ages. But, yeah. I mean, I've seen Eric in person under Anthony's ownership and the poor thing looks mangled to high heaven. Yeah. But that's like the... But it could have been mangled worse. It could have been mangled worse if it had completed that flip on Splinter. Because then it would have been the one fighting Hypnodisc instead. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't and have Eric. Anthony wouldn't wouldn't be owning yeah. Eric because Eric would be in bits in a bin somewhere. Yeah, be like worm. Yeah. Somehow, I don't think it would have reached its meme status had it been just torn apart by Hypnodisc. Yeah, the alternate it would, universe. It would be an icon. Alternate universe where Derek is the meme instead of Eric. <laughs> All right, well, so that's good for Eric. So I think probably Eric's best battle. What do you reckon? They're all they're all fairly entertaining. None of them mm-hmm. stand out. Um, the battle with Gabriel uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> technically counts. the The one against King Box that is Series Three was a good bit of drama for that stage in the heat. I yeah. I think it's fair to say that Eric and Kilohertz were the two best robots to fall in the first round of Series 3. That and Smidzy, I guess, but it wasn't really yeah, well, I mean, tuned in at that point. Smidzy, Smidzy, wasn't Smidzy great and yet. Bulldog Breed and all those ones, Like I, you just write off Series 3. I think on the merit of the robot entered into the tournament, then I think you're probably right. Eric and Kilohertz uh, up there. Yeah. yeah, it's the best fight, probably Splinter. Yeah, very good. All right. Uh, speaking of, I think you said before, doing something with it, let's talk about something. Okay. Sure thing. So something had a very storied history to say it was a weird looking thing that never really changed all that much. It did go through a couple of different weapons, like Series 3 they start off with a pickaxe and then they try a circular saw for Extreme in Series 5. And then they go 
back to the pickaxe for Series 6 again, but if you include the extremes, then this thing managed to be in six series, also while only collecting a single win, <laughs> but it was in six series. Oh, God. Something is a... It's... I really do like the aesthetic, because, but I'm not sure if it if it is just designed to look like a rusted out piece of shit, or if it actually was just made from rusty scrap. I feel like that was probably the design that that the team was going for. Um, I mean, it's it's clearly meant to be inspired by the master. I think that's that's fairly mm. indisputable. Um, but yeah, I, I just yeah. I mean, I've I've checked. It's yeah, according to an interview, it was made from one hundred percent recycled scrap. Yeah. So fair enough. And what does something mean again? Sump is. Uh, Low space used to collect undesirable liquids such as oil. Yeah, that fits with the name and the look. <laughs> yeah, it's like something is is one of those funny names when you see it written. When you try to talk about it in a video or a podcast, it's it's less easy to to demonstrate the humour of of something. It's like how crustacean is one of the best names in Robot Wars ever. But then Craig Charles would just call it crustacean normally, and like, mate, you've completely missed the joke. Yeah, but, I do. I do think yeah. that uh, speaking of you know robot best robots to lose in the first round of series three. Uh, oh no, <laughs> that was a better segue. Are you sure? <laughs> um, something has a really nice way of dying in very fun sort of ways. Like it's it's lost to Thermidor in the tag team, and it's lost to. Uh, Mousetrap in Series 4 both sort of see it just sort of break its own neck or land in a certain way and it sort of its wheels end up spinning in mid-air it's, it's just I love watching something lose it just it's funny yeah it, <laughs> it pretty much breaks itself apart on the charge in like more than one fight <laughs> something is also to blame for Smidzy having more losses than wins because uh, mm. they had this two-time tag team partnership, which they inevitably lost every time. Yeah. Even though, uh, as Toast, I'm sure, is about to point out, Smidzy lasted less long than something did in a lot of those fights. That's, uh... uh yeah. Well, I know they do in Extreme 1, they both did very, very poorly in that fight. Something was technically the last survivor, but... Extreme to something outright lost them that fight. It died, Smidzy didn't. But, yeah, so something's record, one win and seven losses, is by no means honourable. <laughs> but at least, generally, it did always lose to the Heat Widow. Oh, yeah. or a Here we go. Respectable robot. <laughs> like Widow's like, Revenge. Right. Mousetrap, Thermidor. Yeah, that was. There was that one. But, uh, I feel bad no, for... Pussycat, that's Dominator, the one time, Hydra... That's the one time I genuinely feel very bad for something, which is that they got put against Widow's Revenge, and Widow's Revenge existed purely to fight Razor, and it was just like, well, well no one has any faith that something can beat Widow's Revenge, because otherwise this whole thing has just been a waste of time. Like, if we put Widow's Revenge yeah. up against, I don't know, Bot Out of Hell or... Um, you know, some other Series 5 piece of crap, it could probably pull off the win, but they're like, who can we make sure Widow's Revenge is going to fight uh, Razor? And let's give them something. And sure enough, they lose. I know. And it worked perfectly, which it really shouldn't have done. I'm not quite sure how Widow's Revenge even managed to win that fight, but it sure did. It's kind of like the Chronic the Wedgehog Mighty Mouse timeline, except it didn't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Where... <laughs> We were setting up that Thermidor rematch, but then, oh, whoops, we've got Mighty Mouse in a heat final now. Yeah. What are we going to do if Thermidor breaks down again? Yeah, at least but, they didn't uh, They didn't try to make this the heat final versus Widow's Revenge. At least they were smart enough not to try and push their luck with that. Imagine Widow's yeah. Revenge oh, trying God. to fight its way through Rick or... Oh, I suppose Destructor they, Bubble was they there. Do, <laughs> they Yeah, they're supposed to put it against Rick. Well, they're supposed to put it against Suicidal Tendencies, but then Suicidal Tendencies drops out due to its existing difficulties and doesn't get replaced by Rick. 
they just decide to give Widow's Revenge a bye there you into go. the heat final. Easy win. And boom. They're going to get Razor uh, in the semi final. Why didn't they do that somehow? in the first place? We actually could have had Razor Widow's Revenge as the heat final very easily. Yeah. That there would you have, go. That would have been so incredibly cursed. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's finish talking about something. Something's biggest claim to fame is obviously the Series 4 melee where it's its only combat victory and for a long time you know that that one shot of it axing Weldor's you know innards made it look like it had got the KO it sort of subsequently came out that it was a little bit of a shared thing little fly had done a lot of unseen damage but it did a lot for people who love to see little uh love to see uh something doing well I think its main claim to fame really was the team captain yeah just BBC tries to hide clearly an open stoner on children's <laughs> television program, the series. <laughs> Basically. Oh, I love Mr. Digg. He was great. Yeah, good fun. But uh, yeah, all right. Sounds pretty good. So who is next on our roster? Let's talk about Mousetrap, the other semi-finalist that we're going to be talking about today. Yes, an opponent of something, but it was kind of losing to something, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, this And is it was good. losing its nice first round melee segue, as well yeah. to Tiberius. We're sort of playing uh, playing right. the Wikipedia game, basically, where <laughs> you sort of say, how can we get through each of these notables one after another? So there you go. Good good connection. So yeah, so it, like you say, it was losing the fight to, to something, and then... Something sort of was designed... Yeah, losing its first round melee as well to Tiberius and then Evil Weevil just dies in the background. Yeah. Something is sort of... is designed to be... to be... to fight Mousetrap. Like, you know, that one shot of Mousetrap using its weapon on something, it's just like... that just looks like it's meant to look. Like, that feels right. Hmm. Yeah, and there's, there's even... there's even people that actually kind of debate whether... Mousetrap deserved the win over Little Fly. Yeah, it's a it's it's undisputably the weakest of the series four semi finalists, having been placed in the most opportunity heat. And you know what yeah. I don't understand about this heat is who was meant to win. Like, don't tell me Evil Weevil was expected to be like the new thing or the new uh, Scutterbot. Like, you know, no one was rooting for another Weevil Weevil heat win. And you've got. Tiberius, Mousetrap, something, and Little Fly. Well, who was yeah, gonna be I mean, heat in my heat? opinion, the clear best robot in the heat was Tiberius, but they flunked it, so that was that. That that's that that that's something that you can say about Tiberius very often is that it looks very promising and then blows it. Um, but who was going to be in this heat before the the bump from Trident and Blade not coming back? Uh, so just subtract two. So uh, it would be Bigger Brother and Stinger, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I could see them wanting one of those two to go through. Yeah, I think it's still Weldor, but Bigger Brother changes, I guess. Yeah. And that's still a pretty generous heat for Bigger Brother, all things considered. Because mm. like, I just but... think I think these next three heats, K, L and M, have got maybe three or four good robots between them. Like, Spawn of Scudder's Heat is just dead, and Wild Thing's Heat's not much better. Uh, mm. And so, then you look at something else, like, um, I don't know, what is, it? What is a stacked heat? Tornado's Heat is Tornado's a pretty heat? good one. Yeah, yeah um, that's pretty stacked. Uh, certainly, Pussycat's Heat <laughs> have yeah. the best seeds in attendance. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, and even even you could argue, arguably say Steg 2's heat was was fairly good. There was some potential there. Um, yep. But yeah, you look at those and you think, could you just put one of those robots perhaps in one of these? But now that I'm scanning over it, there are a lot less stacked heats than I remember in Series 4. Yep, that, that's early Robot Wars for yep. you. Anyway. So yeah, so uh, Mousetrap arguably probably doesn't get a good fight until its final fight, which is its its loss to S3, which does a lot to redeem Mousetrap in many people's eyes. Yeah, it, it gives a surprisingly spirited performance against S3 and comes really close to slicing into its aerial. 
Yeah, the blade, the bladed mousetrap I never really got until I saw the fight with S3. I'm like, oh, that's why you have a bladed mousetrap. Yeah, mm. that's cool. I like that. Yeah. And it, it, it's, a, it's a good destruction fight as well once S3 gets, uh, gets free from the hug and just starts yeah. ripping it apart. It's the best. It's one of the best fights in Series 5 altogether and widely seen as such, but you do have to wonder sometimes, what if it actually committed to the outcome we seem to be getting? Because when you watch it in hindsight, knowing what would become of S3 and how little Mousetrap was admired as a good robot at the time, you're kind of willing Mousetrap on every time you watch it. It's like, what if Mousetrap actually wins this time? Yeah. It actually cuts off S3's aerial or gets it in the pit or just wins the judge's decision and yeah, that would have ruined the series. Yeah. Because Probably, yeah. you lose your one unseeded heat winner, apart from Bigger Brother, who was basically a seeded heat winner anyway. And then you just get Stinger Mousetrap in the heat final again. And uh, I'm sure Mousetrap would do better than it did before. But then you just probably have Stinger in the semi finals. And Series 5's biggest flaw gets even worse. It does, yeah. And you and also like... miss out on, on S3 as well. Yeah, and so Stinger, Stinger probably loses to Bigger Brother, and then goes. That means we get Wild Thing probably wins the losers melee. Yeah, and then, and then Wild Thing loses to Razor, but yeah, you know, it doesn't change history a lot. But yeah, you're right. It definitely. It, I, I think it does change history a fair bit because like S three puts on a really good performance in Series Five, and then comes back and, and does decently well in Series. Oh yeah, well it changes Series Six, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, so it's like you don't want that to happen. You don't want to lose S3's campaign, but it's so good to see how well Ma- Mousetrap did. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just a brilliant fight. And yeah. Mousetrap in general, we haven't even touched on its design really. The fact that it's actually a mousetrap yeah. is so cartoonish and outlandish, but it actually worked the way it was supposed to and somehow managed to win a heat get four wins in general with this kind of design. Yeah, and for... That in and itself is admirable. Ra- Mousetrap, even if it lost in round one like it was supposed to, to Tiberius and Evil Weevil, I'm sure it would still be looked back on positively yeah. because of how interesting a design it was. Just the fact that it became a semi-finalist, it's almost like an unwarranted history that it never asked for but ended up getting and now it has to be ranked among the other heat winners yeah. rather than and just being the novel design they made it for. And like it, it, it made it to made it to the semi finals, which basically means that ev- everything in that heat was worse at fighting than a desk. <laughs> Shout outs to that one, Evil Weevil. <laughs> wow, e- Evil Weevil was 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 done in by its own inability to have its batteries charged. So <laughs> But yeah, poor yeah. old, poor old mousetrap. Like you know, they get the lowest seeding in series five too. But you know, arguably they're lucky to even, you know, to get that. Um, mm. Like it's 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 not a big complaint. But they do get honoured by being named the most promising newcomer. Uh, like you know, shortlist uh, probably comes second, considering. But that was never going to lose to tornado. That was never going to beat tornado. No. Nor no. was. Attila the Drum, who's our next segue on to speaking oh, of we like best it. newcomers. Back, back to Annihilator uh, notables. Yep, and we're going right back in time to Heat A of Series 4, which is a very, very forgettable melee, uh, which is actually quite good. And I didn't realise it. it sort of blurred in my mind when I first saw this as a kid. All you do is that, pay attention to Chaos 2. And, yeah, that, that's uh, the second the melee you lost. Effect. Yeah. Hey, I don't mind Medusa 2000. I wish it was better than it was. But uh, It should not have got through that melee, though. It should not. Like, no. based on the edit we received, fair enough, if you're going to cut anything out of that fight, it was probably attacks from the doorstop wedge doing nothing of real note. So maybe Medusa 2000 got some attacks in, but we sure didn't see any. Attila at least tried, and yeah, it was catching fire, so it probably lost on damage, but, you know, if you put that aside, it was cosmetic anyway. 
Attila really should have been heading through with King B. And it would have given us quite a crazy matchup against Chaos 2, because if you saw the damage that Attila did to Razor, then Chaos 2 is even more susceptible to taking that kind of damage. I don't think it would have gone ahead and won the fight or anything, but it probably would have given us more drama than Medusa 2000 could have offered. Yeah. It's uh, it's quite a fun robot, Attila the Drum. It's like it's literally just a big old barrel with uh, with the either the mace or the axe at the end, and um, it's very different to Stinger in terms of what we're used to with with axle bots. But it does what it does what it sits out to do quite nicely, and it's uh, yeah, quite an interesting choice. Indeed, yeah, and from that ignominious early exit it goes on to a third place in the southern annihilator mm. having defeated two former semi-finalists uh in the process well did, did, does it did it defeat them or was it another robot in the arena when they were defeated well just the same logic as how thermidor 2 has technically defeated chaos 2 bigger brother and wheelie big cheese <laughs> yeah technically. at once <laughs> yeah all at once yeah it's like yeah. hey Combat combat results yeah. don't lie. No. The combat record between Splinter and Hypnodisc is even at one and one. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. So there you go. Um, Attila the Drum was able to overcome Bear Moth and Spawn of Scutter. Good for them. Yeah. And it, it, it took Pressing off one of Razor's wheels. He's calling well. me on the phone. It wants to say he was there too. Yes, well. Sadly for Versing Getrix. But, yeah, I mean, Attila the Drum, again, it did more in defeat than it did in victory. In the wins, it was just there. And then in the battle that it loses, that's the one where it famously puts a massive dent in the side of Razor and stood a chance of making it through to the Annihilator final. It was a real and scare, again, that, that one. I remember first hearing about that Southern mm-hmm. Annihilator and everyone was like, well, hang on a minute, Razor's... Razor's picked apart the three chunky robots that are in here, and all of a sudden, we're against an Axelbot that's too big for it to crush, and a robot that's too fast for it to catch. And it's like, holy crap, what's going to happen to Razor? Obviously, it does eventually overcome Attila the Drum, but it became quite a, quite a zeitgeist moment for, for Razor fans. Like, oh my god, what are they going to do in this situation? Yeah. And, you know, and Attila... Not only, like I said, it takes off one of Razor's wheels. Attila the Drum does more damage to Razor than Tornado did. Ah, uh, Tornado. <laughs> um, so yeah, and speaking of Tornado, I remember first time I heard about the Best Newcomer nominations and I thought, what on earth are these nominations? Attila the Drum and Robo Chicken. Like, no Chronic the Wedgehog, no Tiberius... No, um, or some other choices they could have picked. Uh, you could argue Atomic, you know. There's there's a bunch of other Heat finalists who didn't get a mention, and they've gone with a first round dropout and a second round dropout. But in hindsight, you look back and you think, well, you know, it's about who's a who's a promising newcomer. And you look at Attila the Drums fights, and you look at Robo Chicken's fights, and say, well, you know what, they are pretty promising, and they're determined, and sure they were set up to lose to the first, sec- first, third, and 19th seed without much, um, you know, chance of going any further than round two. But, yet, here they are. They, they did fairly well, and uh, as Robo Chicken would show, go on to other great things themselves. So, I sort of think the criteria is quite yeah. fitting. All Attila could really do was come back with Jackson Wallop in Series 7, where it did, you know, reasonably well, but then just had a major design flaw, which cost it in the end. Though, but Jackson Wallop is still immortalised by that gash in Shunt's front plough. Yeah, there's that. And, you know, the, the design of Attila the Drum was kind of immortalised in the modern era by nuts, you could say. Mm. That was the, the modern Attila the Drum, as it were, with that... a spinning mace on the end of some chains. And nuts would also go on to fight Razor, but who did more damage to it? That was Attila. It Granted, both, not yeah. won, but but Attila got the hit. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, you know, props to this uh, weird, hairy drum. Um, it's interesting. Um, 
what you say there about uh, about Attila the Drum uh, and Jackson Wallop, whereas you look at someone like Splinter and Mousetrap, whose successes are so forgettable that I literally thought Black and Blue was the successor to Splinter and not the successor to Mousetrap <laughs> earlier in this podcast. So at yeah. least they've got a memorable And so successor. Splinter goes on to be Mutant Splinter in Series yeah. 6 instead of Mutant Mousetrap. <laughs> mutant Splinter, yeah. So speaking of Chronic the Wedgehog, who I mentioned before, let's talk about Chronic the Wedgehog. Oh, boy. And, uh, in a way, the kind of ancestor of an eventual champion. Yes. Kind of. And yet, sadly, their most successful performing version was the Series 4 version, the very earliest version. The the worst version, <laughs> arguably. Um, uh, it's kind of yeah. funny. Are well, there it, any it, other it, are there any other robots whose first version is their worst version and yet their best performing? I'm trying to think. Uh, Foxic. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking a little bit less <laughs> obscure than that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Probably, I mean, arguably Mace probably counts. Yeah, Mace, is, is Mace too better though? Oh well, yeah, true. Um, but while we think about that, let's talk about Chronic the Wedge. Panic Attack, I guess. Panic Attack. You know. Oh yeah. Champion, that's, that's a but good one. easily the worst iteration of that robot, aside from maybe Panic Attack Gold. Yeah. Uh, Spawn again, you could argue. You know, the best mm-hmm. Spawn again was the only one that didn't make a semi-final. Mm-hmm. Even though it's a four-way tie for the other four models. <laughs> But yeah, so we'll Chronic the Wedgehog in such esteemed company as Panic Attack and Team Scutterbots, being their best performance was their initial one, and yeah, it sort of gets a gets a, a good victory over Grave Digger, uh, along with Thermidor too, but sort of really was never going to be better than second place in its heat. Hmm. Thermidor two was much more well designed like the chronic's flipper is so thin that it really was almost more of a lifter at certain points it, yeah it was it it ta- it took a long time for chronic to get a a decent flipper which is unfortunate like it's very rare that you take damage from a flipper <laughs> but chronic the Hedgehog managed it <laughs> yeah um I, I do, however, really have to say the the best version of Chronic is clearly the Series Five one, simply because of what it's actually technically called. Oh yes, mm. Chronic Two Ellipsis. Yeah! That is on the level of Steg Two Osaurus. Yeah, it's just uh, it's an interesting name there. But as we've talked about in the King B. Uh, podcast, they get pretty much dominated by King B Power Works, and this is our only appearance of Chronic Two, who arguably should probably have a claim to seeding over Mini Morg, and yet here they are in a, in a really packed heat, and they really never get a chance to get off the ground. Mm. For that series, anyway. For that series, anyway, their Series Six version is much, much better. Uh, pretty much wiping out the whole melee with help from the pit of oblivion uh taking out panic attack just about the time when people were starting to do it a bit easier than everybody else but yeah able to take out panic attack gold and flip over rocks but you know falling foul of terahertz as so many would do that year yeah that that, there's no shame in losing to to, to terahertz in series six Yeah. yeah Apart from, if you want to mention the fact that Terahertz didn't even have its weapon working for most of the fight, and wow. it died to Terahertz as a wedge bot. But uh, <laughs> speaking, no. of as as speaking of things that they're speaking of things that are shame in, it loses to Mighty Mouse in Series Seven. Oh god! <laughs> oh god! I hate this fight so much. Yeah, having having denied us uh, a Series Four rematch between Chronic and Thermidor Two, as Toast was saying before. With the Widow's Revenge example, this is what they were setting us up for, and then we didn't even get it in the end. Uh, yeah, I find it funny to be honest. Who do you think would have won? <laughs> oh, Chronic. Chronic, totally. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, good. Just get straight under Thermidor's claws and just give it a bit of a prize fight, a toss in. Yeah, yeah probably. So best 
be very yeah. Thermidor couldn't possibly get Chronic out of the arena. No. It's massive. Best yeah, it, it so what's hard. your best what's your best Chronic fight? Series six melee? Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's not very it's not very close. There's not a whole lot else to. <laughs> I don't to... know. My favourite's the mighty, the mighty mouse <laughs> loss. I'm not calling. Yeah, okay. that's not surprising. So that gives us a few more names to talk about. We're going to talk about quickly Crusader Two, who really only had two fights, but really entrenched themselves in everybody's memory with its performance in the melee, uh, in which it really dominated Steg Two, mm. sort of becoming. Quite a quite an effective flipper and rambot. Unfortunately, its armor was made of cheese and <laughs> couldn't really do much when caught between a, a rock and a hard place, which was Shunt and Mortis. Yeah, that, I I really do love that fight just for um, you know Mortis actually putting holes in something with its actual ones, and then Shunt just punches a like a hole like five times the size of what Mortis is doing in one swing, and it's just like. It's just... Oh, I remember when Shunt's axe was powerful. Yes, I do. I, I remember. Shunt's axe was like the thing back in those days. Back oh, in like... God, when yeah. I was a kid, it's like, oh, if Shunt's coming for you, you are so just not going to be happy. Because uh, yeah. back then, it was like the famous... All the famous damage was done by Shunt. You know, the Hypnodisc attack in Series 4, uh, the Crusader 2 one, like all those sorts of things. If Shunt was coming for you, with its diamond bladed axe, you were messed up. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. I I just love I love the look of Crusader too. Just like the really simple the the English flag design, it just yeah. looks so good. Yeah, it, I mean it would have been better if it was a Union flag, just uh, based on personal preference. But I mean, hey, that worked for Major Tom yeah. instead. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's the uh, it's the the George Cross, you know, Saint George and all that. The that Turkish knight that never came to England, but you know. Mm. But yeah, Crusader Two is a, a very very popular robot with alternate series four, you know, tournaments. People like to put it through, including me. A lot of people criticise that, but I am unapologetic. I just that first round melee with Steg Two, it is just so clearly on top, and we just. Considering how much we love our unseeded heat winners later on, uh, if this if this had taken place in say series six and this was you know Crusader two doing this to to Dominator two or Wild Thing or Spawn again, I think it would probably be more popular. But the backlash sort of comes sort of people took Crusader two from about you know a middle of the road to way overrated. Now people have sort of pushed it right back down and now it's sort of a little bit under where it needs to be, but it yeah. sort of moves up and down as people change their minds on it. Mm. But yeah. Uh... So favourite Crusader fight is the melee. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, <laughs> good noted. All right. Yeah. And so I, I, Toast I think said... that's kind of your only option unless you're a really big fan of the Series 3 pinball run of the first Crusader. Oh, that, that black and yellow is so much uglier than the red it and white. Is. And it, it, it's like it's such a common color scheme on Robot Wars as well. Yeah, but... yeah, it's Blade basically. Crusader, it is. It is. Crusader. Okay, guys, listen to this. Crusader One is Blade's big brother, and so when Blade's big brother dropped out of Series Four, they just repainted it and entered it as Crusader Two. There you go. Ah, uh, yeah, I think you've solved the conspiracy wow. there. That's a real galaxy brain moment. Uh, it really is. Let's, let's mm. change change history right there. So, yeah. uh, speaking of flags, let's talk about Major Tom. Oh, Major Tom. What a fun thing it was. I mean, Series 4 is probably its most remembered campaign just because of Shunt axing its head off. <laughs> Shunt comes back into things once again. <laughs> yep. But, um, you know, if you go on Major Tom's biggest success, then I guess... Uh, series 5 is the same stage, but it at least was kind of arguably beating Cat 3 before it paired itself. I love that fight. That That is just a, a pitch-perfect moment of it, of it hitting the pit release and then immediately driving into the pit. Yeah, it's a, it's very popular, that one. It was, it was voted funniest yeah, fight when... in one of the publications, wasn't it? It was in the Ultimate yes. Guide. Yeah. Um, 
Because at that time, Mute versus Judge Dread 3 hadn't happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> and neither had uh, yeah, Eruption versus Carbide in the Series 9 Grand Final, which I find funny. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. I can't believe it. So, which is your favourite Major Tom design? Because I can tell you fairly decisively which one is my least favourite. Oh yeah, I think I think we all know which one's the which one's the worst one. Well, the thing is that Major Tom, it was a good design. Which it one? Was the best one for showing off the flag. We're on about series seven, yes. obviously. Yeah, obviously. But it just, if it was faster, then it'd be fine. I never know with you, Toast. But it wasn't. You, you could very easily turn around and winch. say something else is is the worst one and it would have taken me completely by surprise so I did have to check that we were talking about Major yeah. Tom 3 <laughs> yeah the, for me I Major mean, Tom the, 4 the, my favourite of them is is the Series 6 Extreme 2 version yeah definitely the one with the roll cage is, is yeah. really good the Series 5 one looks like that version of Freezer from Dragon Ball Z with the really really long head that everybody <laughs> knows is not meant to be the final form it's like yeah you're like <laughs> in between Series yeah. four and series six, like you're just you're currently in the middle of evolving. Yes, it is, yeah. good. It is good that One the of those crap transitionary forms that a bunch of second stage Pokemon get. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, it is good that the extreme one version was an actual bumper car, and you could visibly see that. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, the series six extreme two one. Has to be my favourite, probably less so in its completed form, and more so after it had been torn apart by Matilda and Mr. Psycho in the Annihilator. And Thermidor too, don't forget, they knock off a big chunk of Major Tom just by ramming it with its claws. So, you know, move over Tough as Nails versus Robo Chicken. <laughs> move over Can Opener in the same fight. Well, that's fine too, yeah. I was just thinking for damage. Yeah. So, yeah, um... Major Tom, they don't really get a whole lot of success. The Annihilator is sort of their biggest claim to fame in the same way that Attila the Drum and um, a few others get Annihilator success in their lives. Lots of Annihilators in this episode. Yeah, we sort of so have So shall we through. wrap things up with an Annihilator success? Yes. Of course, Series 4's most famous Annihilator winner was Razor, but the one we're talking about is Spikosaurus. Ah. <laughs> uh, it's... Oh, God. Spikosaurus was robbed in the main competition, I think. I was just... Talk uh, about... Remember before when I was trying to think of a packed heat? This is a packed heat. It is. It's got four four robots who arguably were at least heat final quality. Mm. And then also you've got Major... And then it Hammer had and Hammer and Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they've all got their duds. But yeah, I tell you what, first time I, when I saw this as a kid, everyone rooted for... When you're a kid, you rooted for Stinger because it was as close to a cute robot as you could get. And Bulldog Breed, like I was what? a fan of Flippers and, you know, they were doing so well. And so I guess I was rooting against Spikosaurus. But it's only these days, going back and watching this melee, that I realised just how good it is and how unfair it is that we have to lose one of these robots and yet we have to have two of Banshee, uh, Spawn of Scudder and Nightmare, for example. It's like, yeah. I only want one of them. Can I have all three of these I guys? the other fight in the heat is a better example. You have to have Hammer and Tong or Claude Hopper. Well, that's easy for me because I would choose Claude Hopper. So it's actually not that good an example, at least in my opinion. I love Claude mm. Hopper. Yeah, I... I... I like it when it's a shoe. <laughs> but but Spikosaurus. Spikosaurus, at least they gave it that second chance. It's the complete outlier in the Annihilator. The only one that's not seeded. It's in there with Chaos 2 and Suicidal Tendencies and Dominator 2, which I guess was unseeded, but you know, it was a heat winner. Yeah. And then you've got Killer Hertz <laughs> in there. I mean, technically, you could argue that you could argue that Kilohertz is just as much as an outlier, just because it's seeded. It only won one more fight than uh, Spikosaurus did in the same series. Yeah, we, we, we've seen Kilohertz already give a good fight against Chaos Two in the World Championships by this point. Um, yeah, but, you, but when you look at this lineup, it is all these these you know 
the least famous other bot there is Suicidal Tendencies, and even they were reasonably notable. And of that whole list, you would not expect Spikosaurus to be the one that goes all the way, and it is. Yeah, right? it's funny. Like, the first time I ever heard that Spikosaurus won the Northern Annihilator, I sort of heard about the two Annihilators at the same time. Oh, Razor almost lost because this thing happened with the Till of the Drum, and the other one is fucking Spikosaurus won because Dominator 2 broke down and it didn't deserve to win and it should have been Dominator 2's trophy. But, you know, can opener would say your job is to survive, not to necessarily win, and Spikosaurus yeah. definitely survived. It did, yeah. That's, uh, that, that's the thing about Annihilators. They kind of flip the whole game on, on its head because you get these big-name robots that enter it and obviously they are priority target. Like, this this has this is the the episode with that famous shot of everybody just ganking Chaos Two at the same time. And that's the thing, Dominator Two. Not only was it the it was the favorite to sort of win, it had done almost all the work. It had taken out Chaos Two almost single handedly. It had taken out Stinger single handedly, and it had done most of the damage to Kilohertz as well. So like this is probably if Dominator Two had won this, it would have been the most sort of deserving trophy win and yet it just so uncharacteristically breaks down at the end and we end up with Spikosaurus as the winner and it's just delightful yeah i wouldn't have it any other yeah. way no it, it's a uh it is a brilliant showing for Spikosaurus, and it's the, it's the last time we see it as well like it gets like screwed over by that that um by the drawer in heat j and then just comes in, romps through the Northern Annihilator, and then just disappears into the ether forever. They don't even try to enter any of the subsequent um, series. They were yeah. slated to appear in the Third Wars tag team that was cancelled for the behind-the-scenes safety uh, concerns. But aside from that, that is that, that's all we've got of them. Hmm. You know, robots whose final appearance was a win. You've got, like, Eruption and Terahertz and Typhoon 2 and Spikosaurus. Terahertz, not... Oh, yes, it is now, yeah, because of World Series. Sorry, I have repressed the World Series. That's fair. Um, I mean, you, you, it does... You, you got, like... There, there's a bunch of big names in there, and then there's there's also, you know, Anti-B. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, Bill. It is fun, though... Uh, that um, Spikosaurus's sort of con concept design looks very much like a robot that I would have built in one of the Robot Wars video games. It's sort of like that I... big flat dome with the spikes on the side that basically means that it's super easy to flip. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I did make something that looked very much like that in Arenas of Destruction. Yeah. And um, it just feels very strange to me that Spikosaurus did so badly in the pinball, considering it's just literally a bumper box with a really top, with a really high top speed. Mm, maybe they're having, you know, issues with with controlling it or whatever. I think it's got really unlucky. Um, they seem to just get blocked at every angle. But yeah, yeah. so Spikosaurus, it's a good one to good one to end on. What's everybody's favourite Spikosaurus fight? Uh, can I just say the whole Northern Annihilator? <laughs> I'm going to say the melee. I do like the melee more. I wish, I just wish Spikosaurus had done more. It does spend a lot of its time basically welded to suicidal tendencies, but I do wish it had done more, whereas the melee is just a delightful, like, if you don't even know who wins, you're just like, hey, let's just watch these three robots fight, and then does it win? who wins? doesn't matter who wins. Just enjoy the fighting. That's why I yeah, picked that one. Yeah, that's fair. But I, I, th I think I would have yeah. liked to see Spikosaurus progress from that over Bulldog Breed 2, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe even over Stinger. I guess you have to acknowledge the fact in that, that, uh, in that round. I mean, round one of Northern Annihilator did make the top 10 in the Ultimate Count. It did, yeah. There is that. It is true. Yeah. It is very well, true. So good mm. good hustle. All right. So that's our, that's our 10. Uh, we'll count small talk as the 10 because we spoke about that one a little bit. Yeah. So there you small, go. Yeah. Um, we hope everybody's enjoyed our notables. If you have any notables from Series 4 that you think should have been mentioned, by all means, stick them in the description and chat about why you like them. And we'll see you guys next time for another podcast.